Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. Um, I want to say thank you for uh, tuning in and for being a part of this as we study God's Word and apply it in our lives. And so we are continuing in the book of Colossians. So we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 24, and going through the first three verses in chapter 2. And so as you're turning there to Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, I want you to uh, be thinking of this question. Uh, it's an interesting question. I enjoy baseball. And so uh, have you been paying attention uh, um, to the uh, World Series, or excuse me, the, the run for the World Series, the uh, postseason gameplay. Um, perhaps uh, your team has already lost, and I, I hope that's not the case. Uh, maybe your team is, is uh, winning, and they're still in it. Um, but as we look at it and enjoy the game of baseball, uh, I want to ask this question. Um, what are some qualities of a winning sports team? What are some qualities in a wa- winning sports team? There's a lot of things that you can think of, and I'm sure you've thought of something already, but uh, really it boils down to uh, dedication, uh, teamwork, discipline, um, someone who's uh, confident, uh, but also someone who's teachable. Uh, they're willing to take instruction from their coach, etc., stuff like that. And so you can think through um, this idea of, of a successful or a winning sports team and think about the qualities. Uh, but then the question is, how does that apply to the Christian life? Uh, what are those qualities in a baseball team that really should be qualities in us as believers? Um, and so um, in this passage that we're going to look like look at today in Colossians, we're going to see that uh, Paul was encouraging uh, the believers and called them to unity and some other things like that. And so bottom line is that as... Um, as we as believers are pursuing the prize uh, of God's high calling. Uh, In Philippians chapter uh, 3, Paul kind of talks about that, reaching forward to what is ahead. Um, And so when we see Paul and his mindset, he's pursuing something. And so the most important thing is, is that who we're pursuing is Christ. And the prize we're pursuing is so much more important than just simply winning the World Series. Um, And so as you're uh, watching the sports uh, competition, uh, thinking about those qualities, understand that the thing we're pursuing, who is Christ, the person we're pursuing, Christ, is so much more important. And so today we're going to be looking at it. um, Again, remember uh, the book of Colossians was written by Paul while he was still in prison, uh, while he was awaiting um, an opportunity to to stand before Caesar to to hear whether or not he would live or die. And so Paul, in the midst of that, we're going to be looking at his uh, challenge and most importantly his encouragement to the believer's at Colossae. And so uh, Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse number 24, we're going to read through it, and then uh, our focus is going to be this. What is the goal of the gospel? What is the goal of the gospel? So think of that as we dive in. Verse 24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body. That is the church. I have become its servant according to God's commissions um, that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. For I'm wanting you to know how greatly I am struggling for you, for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me in person. I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, uh, this passage of Scripture, as we're diving in, uh, to look at the, the goal um, of the gospel. And, and really, the goal of the gospel is for the, the building up of the saints, uh, the encouragement of the saints, uh, the confidence of the saints. And so we're going to look at that. And uh, first of all, we're going to look at verses 24 through 27. 24 
through 27. And here we see Paul lay out the fact that um, the gospel was his goal. That the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel uh, was the goal of Paul's life because he was commissioned, uh, he was commissioned by God and he was committed uh, to share the gospel, to bring the gospel to those who have not heard it. And so that's what we're going to look at. And so in verse 24, we see that Paul rejoices in his sufferings. He rejoices in his sufferings. Um, And a quick side note real quick is that we notice that he says um, that what is lacking, excuse me, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Who is the you he's talking about? Well, we learn from chapter 2, verse 1, that he was talking about the believers there, but also those in Laodicea, uh, a village or a city nearby, and then also uh, for all who have not seen me in person. And so Paul here, he, he's talking about the, the church in Colossae, um, but he's probably speaking more broadly in the fact that he was bringing the gospel. He was suffering um, for the people, the Gentiles, the people he was commissioned by God to bring the gospel. And uh, uh, we see that commissioning in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 um, talks about the fact that he was sent um, specifically to the Gentiles. And so that's who he's talking about. Um, But as he rejoices in his sufferings, what do we learn from that? Uh, What should we learn from Paul's ability and his desire to rejoice in his sufferings? And I think really what it boils down to is Paul understood clearly the goal of his life. um, Paul clearly understood that God had commissioned him for the purpose of proclaiming the gospel. And so everything else, uh, all this other stuff, anything that happened to him was all for the glory of God. And so he endured everything that came uh, to him, that, that, that every situation he was in, because he pursued the goal of Christ no matter what. And so he can rejoice in his sufferings because rejoicing or being joyful is a lot different than being happy. Happiness often is is dependent upon your circumstances. You have the emotion of happiness, but joy is a choice to um, be content, to be joyful despite your circumstances. And so Paul, he very much encompassed this. And we studied the book of Philippians. And so um, Paul understood that his suffering uh, was for the, the point of proclaiming the gospel. Um, and so he completely understood that. In fact, when he was called, I just mentioned it earlier, in Acts chapter 9, whenever Jesus called him, um, verse 15 says, You will bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Jesus there was talking um, to uh, Ananias and saying, go get Paul and, and know that he's going to, to proclaim my name before the Gentiles and he is going to suffer. Um, this wasn't a surprise uh, for uh, Paul. This wasn't a surprise for Jesus that he would suffer. Paul knew that that was his commission, that in the midst of carrying the gospel, he was going to suffer. And he said, I enjoy it. Not I enjoy it, I want it to happen, but I rejoice because I know that I am being faithful to Christ. I know that I am being obedient in my call. And so he rejoiced in it. So what can we learn? Uh, We can learn that for for without a doubt, that Jesus will use every circumstance for his glory. Um, Romans 8, 28, uh, a very familiar verse, uh, talks about this, knowing that God will work all things together for the good good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. And, and so really, when we look at it, he, he God uses everything to spread the gospel. He uses every circumstance. And so Paul rejoiced in that. Um, and, and yet... Um, we then come to this, this section in verse 24 that's it's kind of a challenging passage of Scripture. And so before we dive into it, uh, I want to ask this. How do we deal with difficult passages in Scripture? Things that um, seem uh, challenging to understand, that seem to, uh, they, they seem to be an apparent contradiction. Um, and so what do we do with that kind of stuff? And I want to encourage you, this is just in general. Um, first of all, I, I would encourage you not to ignore it. Um, don't don't ignore it. Don't just try to pass it by, but look to Scripture. Read the context. Um, sometimes it's uh, very easy to read one Scripture, one 
one um, passage of scripture, one verse, and then uh, say, wow, I didn't know that the Bible said that. But when you read the context, you understand what was being said. Uh, and so we're going to do that. We're going to look at the context. Um, look at the entirety of Scripture. Other passages of Scripture help us understand the passage and helps us dive into it. And so Scripture interprets, um, through interpreting Scripture as and looking to the whole um, a witness of the Bible, we can uh, understand difficult passages. And so then I would say this, is that um, a lot of times objections to the, the Bible can seem overwhelming. And this is in general, but when people bring up objections, sometimes they seem overwhelming at first, but after closer um, examination, it, the truth is revealed. Um, and, and there's a verse that came to mind for this. It's uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17. It says, the first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines him. And so um, when people raise objections or when you find something in Scripture, don't ignore it, dive into it, and look to Scripture for the answer. And so what is the question that I'm bringing up? Well, look at verse 24. It says, And I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body. That is the church. And so we'll, at first glance, Paul seems to saying that there's something lacking in Christ's death on the cross, that it was not uh, sufficient. Yet that's kind of uh, silly uh, if you think about it, because just before, just a few verses earlier in verses 19, this is what he said. He says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Uh, the, the very clear message that Paul was laying out is that Christ's death on the cross was sufficient. And it did reconcile and it brought everything to him. And, and so Paul here in verse 24 is not negating what he just said. And so that's why, uh, but it seems a little confusing. And so we have to dive, um, dive deeper and ask some questions. Uh, first of all, um, when we look at this, um, um, we see that the, the term, what is lacking, um, the, uh, I am completing in my flesh what is lacking. He, Paul has used this in two other passages. Uh, I'm not going to read them, but I'm going to reference them. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, looking at verse 17. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 17, and also Philippians chapter 2, verse 30. Philippians chapter 2, verse 30. And so in these two um, verses, Paul uses this phrase, what is lacking, and, and in both cases, he presents this idea where these men were ministering to Paul. These men were, were providing a gift and serving Paul, and he was, he was thankful for it. And, and he says that they were essentially completing or, or, or providing what was lacking, um, um, lacking in the churches that sent them. So if the churches had been there, if the churches had been present, if the churches had uh, been in the presence of Paul, they would have done it. And so he said that they were ministering what was lacking. And so why is that important? Because in the similar phrase here, Paul is essentially saying that Christ came and he died and he was buried and he rose again and he was completely successful and his death was sufficient to cover our sins. In fact, it says, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Uh, the, the question of salvation is, 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 uh, is finalized. Jesus' death paid the price. What Paul is saying is that he understands that his call as a minister of the gospel is essentially continuing. He's um, completing or filling up what, what is lacking in, in Christ's affliction. And so he's continuing the ministry of sharing the gospel. And so um, Paul's not saying it was lacking. Paul's saying he's doing uh, what he's called to do on behalf of Christ. Um, another aspect of this is to also understand that um, Paul likely had a Jewish apocalyptic setting that he was in. What I mean by that is in the first century uh, church, um, they had a Jewish understanding of the apocalypse or, or the, the coming of, of the end times. And so they were looking for a Messiah, Jesus Christ. The word Christ there means Messiah. And so they were looking for the Messiah. And in Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6, verse, verses 9 and following, we see how um, 
there was an expectation for suffering to continue. That, G, that, that God is waiting for the second coming, for his return, uh, until the affliction of the saints is complete. And so likely Paul understood his life in that. Well, why do I uh, bring that up? Why do I um, talk about that? Because, because of Christ, Paul rejoiced in his suffering. Paul was on mission. He was committed to the gospel no matter what. And, and it's because of Christ. It's because of the hope. It's because of the love and the grace that was shown through Christ that Paul had this. And that is what his, um, his encouragement here is to stand firm on the gospel, to walk in a way that's worthy of the Lord. And as we grow in our knowledge of Christ, as we understand who he is, as we see what Christ did on the cross, we can have this same commitment. It's because Paul understood it that he was committed, that Paul received this, this grace, that Paul was rejoicing in his suffering. And so verse 22, excuse me, verse 25 goes on and talks a little bit about the fact that he was commissioned. He was called to be a servant of the church, to bring the gospel uh, to the church as a whole uh, and, and to, to minister to those who have not heard the gospel. And so uh, we see his goal as making God's word fully known. Uh, declaring the word of God, showing the gospel, showing God's grace. And so he fulfilled this in his missionary journeys. We see that Paul went on several missionary journeys and he had a huge impact on those who he ministered to, who he shared the gospel to, and he planted churches. But also he completed this, he, he fulfilled this, he had an impact on others uh, preaching the word through his 13 letters. The letters that he wrote to uh, demonstrate the gospel, to encourage believers, um, to defend his, um, his, the gospel of Christ, and to show uh, the truthfulness of it, and to correct um, uh, wrong thinking, heresies, etc. Through his letters, we see that he had made known God's word. He made the word of God fully known. And so we look at this, we see this, and we see Paul's um, commission for the gospel and his commitment for doing it. And so here's a question I have. Paul was commissioned for this. What is our commission as believers? What is our commission as followers of Christ? Um, and, and there's a general um, statement that is very clear for us. It's in 2 Corinthians. And I'm going to turn there real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Starting in verse 17, it says this. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So it's talking about believers, those who are followers of Christ, who've uh, asked God to forgive them and, and who have repented of their sin and turned to him. So followers of Christ. It says this in verse 20. It says that, um, it says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ, Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Uh, any believer, every believer, all believers, are commissioned to be ambassadors for the gospel, to, to make a plea for others to come to know Christ. And so Paul, he's, he's talking about the gospel. He's demonstrating his joy in the midst of fulfilling that calling. And, and we, as believers, are given that same call. Um, it's not um, exactly the same as Paul, but it is applicable. It applies to all believers that we have a calling to pursue Christ and to make him known to those around us. And so what keeps us from from fulfilling that calling? What hinders us from being able to uh, be successful in that calling? There's a lot of things, and, and I'm not going to go into specifics because it varies um, from life to life, but really it boils down to this. Anything can hinder us from being obedient to God's call on our life. Anything can stop us and distract us from pursuing Christ and from making Him known. And so Paul is wanting to say, that's, that's no good. We need to be true to the gospel. So we see in verse 26 through 27, he, as he continues on, um, we see him talk about the, um, the revelation of God, how God revealed this mystery. And so um, look at there at verse 26. It says, The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of the, this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
uh, Paul was pointing to Christ as the one who revealed um, uh, it's God's revelation of his plan of salvation. And so in the Old Testament, we do see God's plan of uh, redemption being demonstrated. Uh, so in Genesis, we see a little bit about the fact that um, the, the serpent's head was crushed uh, by the seed. And, 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 and so that's hinting at and starting this revelation. We see the development of it and uh, specifically also in, in the, the life of Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant. We see other passages as well. In the New Testament, we see it becoming more clear. And Jesus is the one who reveals that to us. Um, And so as we're looking at this, we see that Christ is the hope. Christ is our hope, uh, the glory of God, and and we can rely on it. And so Paul, he was commissioned to bring that truth to them. And so uh, Paul conveyed this truth in many other letters. And so that was the focus, that was the goal, the gospel of Jesus Christ, our hope. And that is so important for us. So we looked at Paul and his uh, fact, the fact that he was a individual who was commissioned by God. And then we're going to see that the, the goal of the gospel, the goal of preaching the gospel is that believers would become mature. What that means is that they will grow in their walk with God. And so as Paul uh, was proclaiming the gospel, it wasn't just uh, help them come to know Christ and then leave them be. Paul's focus was on helping them grow into a, a, a mature believer, someone who is obedient to God and who is living for him and and according to his scripture. And so looking back at your spiritual growth as we look at this maturity, what has helped you or who has helped you grow in Christ? Um, Likely it's going to be a a parent or perhaps a Sunday school teacher, um, a friend, a good good, uh, friend, a roommate in college. I don't know. There's a lot of options for that. But really, I want to take a second and think about this. How did they help you? Or another way of thinking it is, how can we help others grow spiritually? What does that look like? Well, I would say that Paul, he, he prayed for them. And so we can help others. We can uh, pray for those who are uh, uh, fellow brothers and sisters that they would grow in their knowledge of God. We can also do that through Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 16 talks about uh, saying that all Scripture is inspired by God, and it's helpful, it's, it's profitable for instruction, correction, and to help us know what it looks like to be uh, complete or mature. Uh, so scripture helps us. And so studying scripture together, being a, 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 a Bible study partner, someone who is reading scripture along with others, uh, setting an example. We, we are called to set an example in the way we live. Um, Titus 2 verse 7 says, In all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds, with purity and doctrine dignified sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. And so as believers, as we uh, help others, I think we need to really be uh, aware that our example, the example we set, is important. Paul did that. He set an example. Um, But the main thing is this. We help others grow in spiritual maturity. Other people help us grow in spiritual maturity as we focus on Christ. As, as, as we are focused entirely on Christ. So I'm going to read verse 28 and verse 29. It says this, We proclaim Him. Paul's saying this, We proclaim Him. Uh, the focus is on Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not a uh, rules and regulations that Paul is concerned about. Yes, there are things that we're called to do, and obedience to God is important. But what is important is that it's Christ who saved us and who died on the cross for us and he calls us to follow after him. It's Christ at the center. And, and so um, as I was reading one of the, the verses, I mean, one of the quotes that came across is that apart from the person and work of Christ, Paul had neither a saving message nor a maturing message to share. If it wasn't for Christ, Paul would have nothing to talk about. Uh, Paul's focus entirely was on Christ. And so um, that is what we're understanding. And as, as we are growing in our relationship with Christ, and maturity in Christ, uh, we understand that we are turning away from sin and turning to obedience. And that why, that's why Paul in verse 28 was warning them, uh, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom. And Paul was warning them about the dangers and the, the consequences of sin, but also teaching them to observe the commands that God gave them, not to earn their salvation, but in obedience to the, the saving grace of Christ. 
So, verse 29, he, he goes a little bit in, in more in depth, and, and we see that verse 29 says this, I labor. So Paul says, I'm, I'm laboring for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in, in me. Uh, Paul wasn't doing this on his own strength, and we as believers can't do this on our own strength. Paul was, the, was demonstrating the fact that he was relying entirely on Christ, and, and we need to do the same. And so the goal of the gospel is maturity, and mature believers uh, knowing Scripture, living Scripture, setting an example, and bringing others along in their walk with God. And then finally, we see Paul's concern. So, so Paul was commissioned for the gospel, and he was committed to it. Um, we see that Paul also um, had his focus on maturity. He wanted to become more like Christ, and he wanted others to do the same. And we see that Paul was concerned for the faithful, for, for, for fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so um, before we dive into it and look at verses 1 through 3 in Colossians chapter 2, I want to ask this question. What is the danger of trying to live the Christian life alone? Why is that a bad thing? Why would that be a problem? Or to ask it another way, um, what's the problem or the danger of uh, failing to regularly um, uh, come to church or, or be a part of a, a body of believers? Or, or what is the danger of not having other believers be able to speak into your life? And the danger is this, is that it's easier to fall. It's easier to fall and it's harder to get back up. When we're on our own, we're, we're on our own. Uh, we need other believers encouraging us, challenging us, holding us accountable. Um, and then I would say this is we, we have a hard task. Uh, being obedient to God, living a life that is glorifying to Him is hard because, one, uh, of the world we live in, but two, of our own selfish desires and, and, and the fact that we are drawn away, we're tempted. And so we need the encouragement of other believers. Paul was encouraging the believers. He was challenging them. He was encouraging them. Um, and so finally, I would say this is if we're not f meeting with re uh, regularly with other believers, uh, we're going to fail to practice the idea of iron sharpens iron. Uh, we need to be around believers, encouraging each other, challenging each other, helping each other become more like Christ. And so um, look at verse 20, uh, excuse me, verse 1 through 3 in Colossians chapter 2. It says, For I want you to know how greatly I am struggling for you, for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me in person. Uh, Paul's very clear he's struggling for the church at Colossae, but he's also struggling for a church in a nearby city of Laodicea. And he's also struggling for those who have never seen him in person. Uh, we see that Paul likely did not go to the church in Colossae. And so likely he's, he's writing this letter to people who've never met him, yet he wanted to demonstrate the encouragement and the unity that can come. And so struggling for you all and for all who have not seen me in person, his desire was for believers to become um, mature in Christ. His concern, his prayer was for those in Christ. And so uh, we can do the same thing. We can uh, be, uh, we can imitate this same um, attitude and practice in our lives. Praying for others uh, and, and, and praying for and encouraging them. Sending them a message and, and, and uh, providing encouragement in their, in their time of need, but also just in general. So what was his message? What was his desire? Why was he doing this? Yes, he wanted to encourage them, and he was, he was struggling for them. But we see it in verse 2 and 3. Verse 2 and 3 says this, I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love. Encouraged and joined together in love. The word encouraged there has this uh, military background to it, and, and it would be a, uh, an encouragement or a, kind of a, a rallying call. Um, Paul was, was encouraging them. He was uh, challenging them. He was um, preparing them to stand firm in, the, in their faith, to understand that, that we're called to be ambassadors. We're on mission for God. And so uh, Paul's desire was for them to be encouraged and joined together in love, united. And that's really important, the unity of believers. Uh, we've mentioned that, we've emphasized it, but that's so important because of uh, Paul's desire was essentially to strengthen the saints, to encourage them in their unity. And so um, how did Paul describe the knowledge of God. He goes on in verse number two. He says, um, join together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ. The knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
what's the goal? What's the focus? What's the point? Uh, what's the bottom line? It all points to Christ. And so Christ, if, if we know Christ, then we don't have to worry about other things. If, we, if we're drawing closer to Christ, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, it reminds me of uh, Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. In that context, it was talking about worrying uh, about how to provide for yourself, food, clothing, etc. And it said, trust in God because he knows. Um, but the, 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 the truth is there. In every aspect of our life, if we are putting Christ for first, and then it does not matter. And if we focus on Christ, if we know Christ, then we will be living in obedience. Um, and so uh, there's another quote that came up in my study, and it said this, and this is very encouraging to me. Christians do not have to know everything in order to live and minister with confidence. Christians don't have to know everything to, in order to live and minister with confidence. We simply must know the most important truth of all. That is God's mi mystery, Christ. We, we need to know Christ. We need to be confident in Christ. We need to rely on Christ. We need to have our strength in Christ. Everything is wrapped up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's Paul's message. The goal of the gospel is for believers to become mature, to grow in their knowledge of him. And so the gospel is the starting point. The gospel is the encouragement and the motivation. The gospel is the power for us to grow in Christ. And that's what Paul was all talking about. And so how do we apply this to ourselves? How, how do we apply this scripture? And so the question that comes to mind is this, how does knowing the goal of the gospel impact your attitude towards spiritual growth? How does knowing the goal of the gospel impact your attitude towards spiritual growth? That goal is for believe people to come to know Christ and to grow in their maturity in Christ. The gospel points us to Christ and growing in Him. So how does that impact you? Hopefully, uh, it can demonstrate that there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. Uh, the gospel of Christ is this. We're sinners. We can't save ourselves. But Christ, on the cross, offered us salvation, forgiveness of sins. And, and we need to respond to that. So uh, it, should, uh, it should encourage us that there's nothing that we can do to add to our salvation. It's complete in Christ. Uh, I, I would say the next thing is that we need to recognize that Christ died so that we can be spiritually renewed and dwell in Him. And Christ died so that we can become more like Him, so that we can know Him. And so if we are followers of Christ, if we're in Christ, we've placed our faith in Him, then the gospel is the evidence and the motivation for us to grow and to be obedient. And so finally, what it really boils down to is this, the gospel transforms our life. That should be encouraging. That should be challenging. Um, but that should also be uh, our, our goal as well. Paul's goal was the gospel. Our goal should be the gospel of Christ, knowing it so we can become more like Christ. So here's the personal challenge I want to give to you. Um, as you uh, finish out this week, as you're thinking about what's coming up and whatnot, uh, think about this. How is it that you can encourage another believer? How can you encourage another believer in Christ, um, whether that's through praying for them, uh, whether that's through... Um, serving them in some way. Uh, it could be sharing a Bible verse, a word of encouragement. Uh, there are many ways that you can do this, but I would encourage you to do that. Encourage another believer. Uh, come alongside of and minister to them because we are united together in love. We're united in Christ because of what he's done for us, the gospel. I'm going to pray for us, and hopefully as we meditate on this, as we think about God's word, and the, the goal of the gospel, the goal of the gospel is to become more like Christ. And I challenge you to do that. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for what you are doing in and through us. God, I pray for us as believers, for myself, but also for those watching, those listening. God, that you will encourage them that you will uh, help them grow in your knowledge, uh, grow closer to you uh, with all wisdom and understanding uh, because we can rely on you. And as we look into Scripture, as we apply it, we will become more like you. We trust in you. We ask to glorify you in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.